your magnificences, excellencies, spectabiles, honorabiles, professores, doctores, cives, academici, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I hereby open the lecture of the Czech Republic and the United Nations, Peace, Development and Human Rights in a Changing World, by the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency, Mr. Pan Ki-moon, whom I cordially welcome among us. Please allow me to welcome on behalf of Charles University our dear and distinguished guests who are attending this lecture. They are Mrs. Ban Suntaek, wife of His Excellency Mr. Ban Ki-moon, and all members of the United Nations delegations together with Her Excellency Mrs. Edita Herda, the permanent representative of the Czech Republic to the United Nations. Permit me also to express our pleasure at the presence of the ambassadors and other members of the Prague Diplomatic Corps. I should also <coughs> like to welcome all the representatives of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Finally, let me welcome the rectors and other academic dignitaries from Prague universities, as well as other visiting scientists and scholars, teachers, staff, <coughs> and especially students from our university and all our guests today. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles University has decided to confer a gold medal on Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, on the occasion of his visit to the country. I shall now ask Professor Medicine Dr. Tomáš Zima, Doctor of Sciences, Rector of Charles University, to deliver to la laudation. His Excellency, Secretary General of United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, Madame Joban Sontaek, distinguished guests, magnificence, rectores, excellencies, dear students, dear colleagues and friends. I am warmly welcome you on behalf of Charles Uni University on occasion of your state visit and the lecture in our Magna Hall. Charles University is the oldest university north of Alps and east of Rhine indeed rich and in Papalbula of January 26, 1347 in Avignon, Clement VI declared with his apostolic authority that in the aforementioned city of Prague, general studies in each and every permitted area of study, at the time it's mentioned art, law, medicine and theology, shall flourish in the near future and that its teachers and students could anticipate it all privileges and liberties as those of their colleagues at any university. The founding goal of Prague General Education was accepted on April 7, 1348, which Charles IV, Czech King and Roman Emperors issued upon his authority of Czech sovereignty and also put under auspices of the Saint Wenceslav, the patron of the Czech Kingdom. Now the Charles University consists of 17 schools and our academic community contains more than 50,000 students and 8,000 academic staff. I would like to introduce His Excellency Ban Ki-moon to this auditorium. The Secretary General was born in the Republic of Korea in 1944. He received a bachelor degree in international relations from Seoul National University in 1970. In 1985, he earned a master degree in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. At the time of his election as Secretary General, Mr. Bunn was his country's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade. 
His 37 years of service with the ministry, including posting in the New Delhi, Washington DC and Vienna, and responsibility for a variety of portfolios, including foreign policy advisor to the president, chief national security advisor to the president, deputy minister for policy planning and director general of American affairs. Mr. Bun's ties to United Nations date back to 1975 when he worked for the Foreign Ministry's United Nations Division. That war expanded over the years with an assignment that included the services as chairman of preparatory commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization and chief the cabinet during the Republic Korea's 2001 and 2002 presidency of the United Nations General Assembly. Mr. Ban took office on 1st January 2007 and on 21st June 2011 was unannounced re-elected by the General Assembly and will continue to serve until uh, December 2016. His Excellency Ban Ki-moon is the 8th Secretary General of the United Nations. His priorities have been to mobilize world leaders around a set of new global challenges from climate change and economic upheaval up to pandemic and increasing pressures involving food, energy and waters. Your role is a crucial for the preservation of peace, friendship, humanity on our beautiful earth. Quod bonum Felix Faustum Fortunatum que eveniat. Dear Secretary General, Charles University, one of the oldest universities in Europe, true to its historical tradition, expresses its recognition and honor for those who have made exceptional contributions to education and the common good. Charles University's golden medal, which bears the stamp of the original historical seal of the university, is awarded as an expression of our recognition and honor for your contribution for the development of cooperation and mutual understanding among nations. Allow me, Your Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, at this ceremonial moment to present you with the Charles University Gold Medal as an expression of friendship and deep respect for you. Please. Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Mr. Ban Ki-moon to give a lecture titled The Czech Republic and the United Nations, Peace, Development and Human Rights in a Changing World. Thank you. Distinguished Rector of Charles University, Professor Thomas Zima, Professor Robner, distinguished faculty members, excellencies, members of the diplomatic corps, Your Excellency Ambassador Edith Ahurda, permanent representative of Czech Republic to the United Nations, dear students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am deeply honored to be here today and thank you for this uh, distinguished recognition. 
As you may know, during London Olympic Games in 2012, two years ago, and also this year, January, in Sochi, Russia, I ran the torch, Olympic torch. But I never dreamed of earning a gold medal. Thank you, this gold medal. <laughs> I accept that this high honor of this gold medal of Charles University on behalf of uh, many thousands of United Nations staff who have been working and who are working with a strong commitment for peace and human rights all around the world, often under very dangerous circumstances. Many of uh, United Nations staff and soldiers, peacekeepers, they have uh, paid their ultimate uh, price their lives for peace and stability and human rights. They are the real champions. They really deserve these gold medals. Yet there is a two gold medal I should have been given to those people. But as a Secretary General, I am receiving that the honor on behalf of many uh, people uh, who have been working day and night, risking their lives for human rights and peace around the world. Distinguished faculties and students, ladies and gentlemen, Charles University has a long, very long history. I know that uh, next Monday you are going to celebrate the 666th anniversary. I should have uh, timed for my visit to your university on that day, next Monday, but uh, somehow I was not uh, aware of that. Uh, I'll try to uh, do that maybe 776th uh, <laughs> <laughs> birthday. <laughs> I hope I'll be here, but I may not be here. It's a real uh, privilege and honor for me uh, to have this opportunity of sharing uh, some of my thoughts as United Nations Secretary General with the faculty members and particularly, uh, particularly with those young students uh, who will be responsible for this world from tomorrow. And I hope uh, what I'm going to uh, share with you uh, this morning will be very helpful in getting your sense, better sense, and better vision, and higher vision uh, for world peace and security. The United Nations has been working with uh, Charles Universities, and your academics have even co-authored United Nations reports. The United Nations Human Rights Office has cited your human rights education as an example for others. In fact, when you are oppressed by communism and by dictators in dark days, your people, your young people, have uh, risen against this dictator and communism. And there were a lot of sacrifices. On the basis of this sacrifice and your commitment, you have achieved such a shining example of uh, democracy, fuller democracy, and fuller participatory uh, democracy. And I'd like to uh, sincerely congratulate. And this experience uh, should be shared with many people around the world who still need to transition uh, toward the better future and the democracy. Many of your graduates uh, have worked directly with the United Nations on issues related to health, environment, and diplomacy. I'm honored to follow many distinguished speakers who have come here. Particularly, one of my distinguished predecessors, Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuella. The Czech Republic is a dynamic United Nations member states, active on the Human Rights Council now, contributing to peaceful settlement of disputes and helping other countries to achieve a democratic transition. 
The beautiful historic center of Prague was declared UNESCO World Heritage Site. I was very much impressed walking to this Charles University on this beautiful historic town. It really gave me inspiration, a lot of inspirations, not to mention enjoying fresh air. Well, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Now, this university is, was built in the 14th century. This is a remarkable uh, tradition and historical tradition of which you need to be very proud. Last year, we celebrated together the 20th anniversary of Czech Republic's admission to the United Nations. I participated in that celebration ceremony. Your country entered the United Nations when many of you, but your young students, entered the world. Now you and all of you are moving into the world of even greater transition and upheavals with the looming threats and promising opportunities. The Czech Republic has been buffeted by the winds of global change many times in its history. You have a direct experience of rivalries between the great powers. Uh, today, other uh, key players are emerging. They say that Asia will soon surpass Europe and North America in terms of economic strength, population, and technological investment. Africa's growth is rising. Six out of 10 fastest growing economy are coming from Africa. They are changing their dynamics. Change is visible well beyond the metrics of markets. Demographics show the emergence of a new world. The world's population is shifting. We have the largest population of a young generation today. But if you go to uh, by 2050, there will be more people of over 60 years old than under 15. This world at this time is very young. More than half of the world population is under the age of 25. So this world is very young. So it is only natural that our generation and our teachers and leaders of today should do much, much more for our youth, young generation. And there is a rapid urbanization taking place. Uh, today's cities will become tomorrow's mega cities. By 2050, most of the people, more than 70% of world's population, will be living in one of the big cities which will create the very, very serious problems. You may know that the big cities, they create the, all the problems, all the good things, but at the same time, all the problems which we have to take care of. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many stress points on world's, today's world maps. Many people in this region and across the world share my concern about the crisis related to Ukraine. The stakes are high. Emotions are running high. The rhetorics are politically and sharply charged. That is why I traveled to Moscow and Kiev last month. It was just uh, two weeks ago. I spoke to President of Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, about this uh, volatile dynamics. I underscored the need to de-escalate the tensions and importance of sitting together with authorities of Ukraine and engage in direct and constructive dialogue to resolve this issue. If not, the situation might develop into an uncontrollable situation beyond Moscow and beyond Kiev. In both Moscow and Kiev, 
I urge the leaders to avoid this hasty move and any premature actions which may start an uncontrollable situation. And they must immediately begin a meaningful dialogue. I sincerely hope that this dialogue will continue to resolve all these issues harmoniously. This is more than a situation in Ukraine. It's more than regional European issues. It has a global political implications. It has even a geo-economic implications. The problems of Ukraine are reverberating far beyond this region. They are causing divisions in the international community at a time when we need all those countries to unite to tackle global problems, which I'm going to discuss with you more in depth. I'll continue to do my utmost to promote a peaceful diplomatic solution in keeping with the principles of the United Nations Charter. Ladies and gentlemen, as we confront crisis from Ukraine to Syria, we are also focused on conflicts that are no less worrisome, but often far less visible on the world's front pages. There are many frontline front crises, like Syria and Ukraine. They take the frontline pages all the time. There are many forgotten crises, they are neglected, neglected crises. Terrible unrest in South Sudan, horrific brutality in the Central African Republic. At the same time, I strongly believe we must keep our eyes fixed on what may seem less immediate but more destructive long-term threats. We face a crossroad moment. I have been often speaking to world leaders that while you are fighting and struggling and arguing over Ukraine issues, and what about all these tragedies in Syria? Not many people are talking about Syria these days. Not many talk, people talk about Central African Republic, where many people are dying. Then what about all these uh, global development issues, climate change? Because of this, your limited time and energy and resources are diverted only on one place. As a Secretary General of the United Nations, I have to address all these, all these issues for humanity. There are three issues at this time on the global agenda for the coming year that will shape for people's lives for generations and generations to come. 2015, next year, will be a year of global choices. Maybe it may not be a choice, that we have to do. First, the Millennium Development Goals. We must accelerate and must use all available resources and will, political will, uh, to meet the targets of Millennium Development Goals. This was the blueprint announced and adopted and announced by the world leaders at the dawn of New Millennium 2000. They have given 15 years. 15 years at that time seemed to be long, far away. But it's coming next year. We have less than 640 days, less than one month and eight months or some days. We have to do all what we can, the eight goals, to reduce abject poverty as much as we can, to reduce the number of unnecessary death pre from preventable disease, to have all the school-age children to go to school, at least primary schools. And we have to care about our warming, warming earth and planet Earth. These are imminent issues which we should not lose any sight any time. 
important progress has been made in fact. We have been able to cut in half the number of abject poverty, and we have been able to provide the primary education to most of the school children around the world, including in the developing world. But still, 57 million children are out of school. They're just wandering around in the street during daytime. And there are still many women and women and girls, they are keep being killed. There are many millions of boys and girls who are born but cannot celebrate the fifth anniversary, fifth birthday. They all die before they reach age five. We have to prevent this one. That means this poverty still affects more than one out of seven people. That means at least the one billion people go to bed hungry every night with a hungry stomach. We have to fill their hungry stomach by 2030. But our target was that to cut in half, but still we have one billion people. Hunger plagues nearly a billion people. Diseases we know how to cure still kills tens of thousands of children every day. Women are not adequately represented in governments and in parliaments across the world. And the warming global climate is undermining our planet's future. I'm urging the international community to spare no effort in speeding up our progress to meet the MDGs by next year. At the time, we must usher in a sustainable future while adapting to changing global landscape. That is my second priority, and United Nations' second priority. That is to define and establish a vision for post-2015. That means from 2016 to 2030, another 15 years, I expect that world leaders will come to the United Nations in celebrating 70th anniversary next year and declare uh, their vision, giving sense of hope and giving their commitment. We have already opened the global discussions to establish that sustainable development agenda. Our goal is to formulate a bold and ambitious and concrete and easy to communicate sustainable development vision by next year. This is a firm commitment. And this time, this vision should address comprehensively all the aspects of our life, economically, socially, and environmentally, covering all three dimensions of our life. MDG was designed mainly to help the developing world. But this uh, sustainable development now should cover developed and developing both all together, all together for people of the world. Our goals will aim for prosperity and sustainability. So you might think of them as a GPS, sort of a GPS that shows the path to a better world for all the people in the world. That, again, leads me to third priority. That's the climate change. A lot of people have been talking about climate change by this time. And United Nations and I as a Secretary General have been able to bring this agenda of climate change to, to the top of the global agenda. But there were some leaders, there were some skeptics about the climate change. But now, with the help of uh, many scientists who have been working in IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their successive reports have made it plainly clear, scientifically clear, that climate change is happening. This is affecting all the countries around the world, regardless of where you are, you are living. Czech Republic is no exception. It's not affecting only 
developing world. I was in Greenland just 10 days ago. And in fact, I was so much surprised and alarmed by what I have seen. During the last seven years as a Secretary General, I have been visiting all the places wherever and whenever I was able to see for myself the impact of climate change. First, I went to Antarctica, then I went to North Pole, and I went to Brazil to see the impact of deforestation, how deforestation affects the climate, this earth. I went to Sahel, the long spell of drought, how it affects their lives and our world. And I went to Lake Chad. In just 30 years, this once looked like a sea. This is a huge ocean, uh, huge ocean like Chad Lake has shrunken into one sixteenth, one sixteenth of its original size. I went to a Aral Sea. It was a sea, but it's a completely dried up. And there is only salt. Thick layers of sea salt, which has become dry land, dry land. And finally, I went to Iceland, then after that, Greenland. Iceland, I was told by the president of Iceland that will be Iceland's land in 150 years, 150 years. It may take a little longer time in Greenland because there were much, much more ice there. But I was able to see these ice caps were melting very, very quickly. This is the place where icebergs are moving fastest and ice is melting fastest. It causes sea level rise. There is no time to lose. Around the world, climate change is an existential threat. But if we harness the opportunities inherent in addressing climate change, we can reap enormous economic benefits. I'm convening a summit meeting on climate change in New York this September, September 23rd. I have invited all the leaders from the, from the world, political leaders, business leaders, and civil society leaders, and activists to come to the United Nations to show their commitment and raise their political will. And I'm asking them to bring the ambitious, political, and targetable and measurable ambitions. And I'm going to ask the President and Prime Minister of Czech Republic to come to the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, these are big challenges, and we cannot tackle them alone. The United Nations cannot do it alone. However, a country may be resourceful and powerful. One cannot do it alone. When we are talking about powerful, rich, and resourceful, we think uh, easily European Union, a group of 28 uh, richest countries, and maybe United States or Japan. China has become one of the richest countries, but they cannot do it alone. We have to collect all our resources, our wisdom, and most importantly, political will. The will that we will address, we will challenge this climate change. Without that, you will have to regret for your grandchildren and great, great, great grandchildren who will be coming after you. That's why I'm so focused on activating real drivers of change in today's world. That starts with ensuring equality for women and empowerment of young people. There are many resources in our world now. The least utilized resources in the world. Do you know what this is? This is a women. Half, more than half of the global population 
consists of uh, women. But how, how many women are actively engaging in productive society to make this world more so productive? The least utilized resources among human resources, women, we have to utilize them, fully use their potential. And we have to give decent job opportunities to young people so that they can be ready, not only contribute, but they should be ready to be able to take in leadership, leadership role from tomorrow. Uh, today, we have to have more women in parliament. My message is that when you go to any company, any government, there are many women working in a relatively insignificant positions. Those are mostly women. But when you go up the ladder, there are very few women. Then I'm asking that more women should be employed in decision-making positions. If you read, uh, if you read the research of uh, Fortune 500, then those companies where more women are sitting in the boat, they earn more money. This is a fact released by economic uh, research, very reliable economic research institute. So if there are more women in parliament, if uh, more women in government, it will be a better world. Just a few days ago, uh, I, I think it is Monday, by coincidence, I saw a CNN news in the morning. There is, a, you may check, um, there is a Harvard professor who wrote the book. What will happen to this world if this world is ruled by women? This is a title. The answer is that there will be fewer wars, less wars, if women rule this world. I fully support. I fully support. That is why I have appointed at least one third of UN peacekeeping operation led by women. I have uh, 120,000 peacekeepers, soldiers, in a sense that uh, jokingly saying I am the second most powerful commander in chief in the world, only after President Obama. U.S. has more than troops in foreign countries. United Nations is the second, much bigger than United Kingdom, France, or Germany. We have 120,000. We have 15 UN peacekeeping missions. We have 30 political missions. But 15 peacekeeping missions are all with soldiers, police. There was not a single woman in the history, these missions were all led by men, generals, or politicians. I have appointed one third of these peacekeeping missions. Now they are commanded by women, hoping that there will be less war. This is a big ex experiment, but I think I have been successful. I have been successful. You can check with the United Nations record. Again, for the first time, I have appointed the woman peace negotiator, woman peace, peacemaker, Mary Robinson, former Irish president. She has been successful in bringing peace in Democratic Republic of Congo and Great Lake region. And just look at this case. The chemical weapons of Syria is now being destroyed. The head of this destruction team, joint mission, is a woman again. It's a, I'm just trying to change basic perception, misperception about women and mentality of men's society that women can do exactly what men have been or men can do. So let's change all this mentality. I'm asking all men leaders uh, sitting in this hall. And young people. Sometimes there are many young people who do not know. They are just roaming without 
knowing what to do. Simply opportunity is not given, their potential is not being fully utilized. There is a serious youth unemployment problems at this time. You have an unprecedented ability to network, ladies and gentlemen. You have to access, you have access to information at lightning speed. But it takes more than connectivity to change the world. It takes conviction. The late Václav Havel spoke about this when he addressed the United Nations in his capacity as president in the year 2000. He said, I quote, the most important thing that we should seek to advance in the era of globalization is a sense of global responsibility. This is what I have been emphasizing, that everybody should be responsible. Your family, your community, and your country are all extremely important, but their security, their prosperity alone is not enough. You have to rise above the national boundary, Czech boundary, and even European boundary. You have to become a global citizen. You can do this in many ways, whatever profession you may choose. Then whatever you are going to do uh, should be aimed at as a responsible, global responsible citizen for global prosperity, global uh, unity. That is my call to you now today. Be a global citizen, stand up for peace, justice, human rights, and common prosperity for all of us. Let us work together to make this world better for all. That's our moral and political responsibility. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Dear Secretary General, thank you so much for your inspiring speech. I am sure that especially students, young people here, that they will be mobilized to answer and to find the question, uh, answers for the questions um, dealing with the challenges you were referring to. And thank you also for your contribution. Uh, dear friends, let me thank you for coming to the lecture, the Czech Republic and the United Nations, Peace, Development and Human Rights in a Changing World. Today's program is completed. Quod bonum, Felix, Faustum, Fortunatum, Eveniant. Your, your Excellency, we will go down here.